It's all about getting involved in the debate. Okay, it's not just a case of sitting around listening to somebody talk. So how the evening will work is that we'll have our invited speaker will give a short talk, then we'll have a bit of a break so you can go and recharge your glasses at the bar, and then we'll come back together and hopefully get some interesting debates going on. Um, so this will be your chance to take part in the discussion. Okay, it's all about getting in involved. Feel free to also get involved via Twitter and Facebook. Um, we'll put up the hashtags and things during the break. And if you enjoy this evening, you'll have another chance to listen to Bryce talk tomorrow night, where we'll be at Talbot Campus in the loft. And that's when Bryce will be talking about his main love, which is the use of prostheses in elite sport. Um, we also run a Café Scientifique every month on the first Tuesday of the month. So again, if you enjoy yourself this evening, feel free to come along. We're at Café Boscanova every month. So all that remains is for me to introduce our speaker, Bryce Dyer. And we know it's going to be good as Bryce gave one of the first of our talks when we first started up Café Scientifique in November last year. Um, and since then, he's been awarded the accolade of being chosen to give a prestigious talk at the British Science Festival. So please join me in welcoming Bryce. Remind us then. You said that's how yeah. it? Everyone hear me at the back. Good, yeah. promise. Half an hour top. The last time I said it was half an hour, it was 45 minutes. 50. 50. <laughs> last time I cut it down. Uh, what I'm doing tomorrow night is completely different to what I'm doing tonight. So um, the two don't clash, they don't repeat, and they don't repeat anything that I did when I did the one last November. So this is all sort of new bits and pieces, and quite a lot of different things happened since some of the familiar faces I've seen here from last year. Um, what tonight's one is about is really about my experiences with the media over the last couple of years, but also actually about media and science in general as well, uh, and some of the issues that relate to that, and some of the problems that, I'll be honest, I had no idea about before I waded into it. Um, give me a bit of background for those that don't know who I am. I've taught at the university for 12 years. Um, until the last four years, I would say I was research inactive. I was a teaching lecturer, predominantly. Uh, I was prior to university education or university teaching, I was a, a product designer in industry and a project manager. So I was from a, a production and design environment, not an academic background, and I came in quite late. About four years ago, uh, due to a changing climate at the university, but also because of the fact I've been putting it off, I decided that I needed to move more into research. Uh, but I'm not a traditional academic, as I say, and I wanted to try and take what I was doing outside of the university environment because problem with a lot of the stuff that academics do is a lot of it gets gathering dust and never really, people never really understand it and never really get a chance to see it. So I wanted to try different tacks. So the university whacked me onto a media training course, which I was initially quite sceptical about and was probably the best short course I've ever done. It was a really eye-opening experience. Anyway, let's get into this and I'll explain what happened and uh, some other bits and pieces. Now this talk is broken into three. The first bit's going to be about media and science in general and to talk about some of the things that happen in general with science and academia and media outlets. The second half, and the, the two bits that make up that, are two different case studies, both that I was involved with in one way or another, and to show you some of the lessons that I learned from the media course and all this kind of stuff. Hopefully you find it interesting, but if you don't, don't worry. Right. Okay, so let's talk about science first. Now, university ideally is often seen as an ivory tower. It's where funny and clever things apparently happen, and everyone else who lives in the towns around us, ideally what we do in the academic environment should, ideally, spread throughout society and enhance society as a whole. That's, the, that's supposed to be what's supposed to happen. But the problem is there is a gulf between what happens at universities a lot of the time and what happens in the wider community. And scientists are often misunderstood, or academics are stereotyped and misunderstood. And a lot of good stuff that does go on behind walls, such as a place such as this, is never seen because it's never packaged right, or because, in my 
limited you, it's sort of more youthful experience of academia, um, a lot of the best researchers I know aren't very good with people. And actually some of the best presenters I know don't really know a lot. So sometimes it's really difficult to get the right vehicle to do it. Who does it? Now, for those of us who were probably born prior to 1990, all three of these people might well be known to you. Anyone who's born after 1990 probably won't recognise two of these people, but these, all three of these people are fantastic science communicators of the last 20 or 30 years. Far left is David Bellamy, obviously those of you might see a lot of wildlife and gardening sort of stuff in the 80s. Obviously Brian Cox in the middle, and the science festival thing I've got to do later this year was how, what launched Brian's career. So. Um, he did it on the universe, mine is on a somewhat more simplistic topic. And on the far right hand side is Johnny Ball, who actually isn't really an academic at all, but he was a guy who was very interested in numbers and mathematics. However, when you actually ask the public what they really do think about science, what they actually see is probably something a bit more like this. So what you've got is uh, bottom right, uh, Mr. Spock from Star Trek, we've got Dr. Frankenstein in the top right, bottom left we've got uh, Dr. Bunsen, Honeydew and Beaker, for those of you who are Muppets fans. And top left, we've got Doc Brown out of Back to the Future. On the whole, a lot of people, when you speak to your friends, think that scientists or academics are frankly nuts, okay, and a bit weird, and don't talk normal language. Luckily, I'm from Essex originally, so my accent comes quite through, so I sound far thick than I actually am. Right, so, should academics actually be celebrities is one of the things I want you to think about first, in that actually, is it a good thing for an academic? Does it give us... Uh, mixed messages if, a, if an academic is being passed off as a celebrity. I'll give you a good example of that. Brian Cox was presenting a programme on BBC Two recently about wildlife. It, there was a little bit of mathematics in there, but it was predominantly about life on the planet. But actually, that's not his area of expertise. His area of expertise is cosmology and astrophysics and the universe as a whole. So the question there is, as the point where someone's reputation began to overtake their expertise, is that necessarily a good thing? And I'll show you the pitfalls of that a little bit later on. Real science, a quote I'll read out to you. Now, I read a really good book about a week ago, which is why I completely rewrote this talk about six days ago. Because I've written it all out and thought, this is rubbish. Read a book and it changed my thinking on everything I'm telling you now. It's a book by Bennett Goldacre and it's called Bad Science. And I recommend if you ever get the chance to read it or go to his blogs. I think he worked for the Guardian or the Telegraph. He exposes fraudulent or incorrect science. It's really, really interesting. What he says is, is that science isn't about authority on white coats. It's about following a method. And that's actually a really important distinction. For those of you that aren't in the academic profession or maybe haven't been at university or school in a while, the problem that we often have is, is that people often think that scientists are important because they have a doctorate, because they have a PhD. Interestingly, I don't hold a PhD at the moment. I haven't done my final exam yet. It's imminent. But the point here is I've noticed a very, I'm treated very differently because I don't hold a doctorate. And yet I've met other colleagues who do hold a doctor that are held in much far higher esteem, frankly, because it's seen as a gold standard, as it should be, but it is seen as a gold standard. But someone like Johnny Ball has proved that you don't have to be a doctor to be a very good science communicator, and you can teach a lot of people good things. And the important thing is, as like it says in the quote, just because you are a doctor doesn't mean to say you know everything. Science is about following a particular method. It's about identifying a problem, designing an experiment, producing results from that, and then discussing those results and how they apply to society and the world around us. And people often don't see that. They lose sight and lose touch of that. Or they're too intimidated by what they're being faced with. And it's good to ask questions. So, F equals MA. Let's cast our minds back to physics and GCC and O levels and the rest. Anyone remember what that formula was for? I bet you don't. Force equals mass times accelerator. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> okay. Newton's second law of motion. Try this one then. Any ideas? That's a website. <laughs> it's actually, uh, the point of the proof here is this is actually a formula apparently that's been created for the perfect way to eat ice cream. It is utterly useless. However, notice the length of the formula, notice the complexity as you first think, you think, bloody hell, what the hell is that for? The point I'm trying to prove here is more is not necessarily more. F equals MA is one of the most important formulas that was ever discovered. It's changed the way that we perceive the world around us and teaches us how things happen the way that they do. The second formula is utterly useless. It's been created purely for a media franchise, a media outlet to sell as an interesting story or tidbit. But as a result, people get the wrong idea. One, about science, and two, about the credibility of the people that are putting it out. There's a tipping balance between communicating something useful and just trying to be an expert. And there's a real subtle balance, and sometimes an academic's ego, mine as well, 
can sometimes get pulled and carried along by sometimes a lack of quality, a lack of message. So you get this kind of push and you get this kind of pull thing. Sometimes science pushes things into the wider society, sometimes media pulls it. On the whole, media generally pulls what it wants and science kind of goes along with it. So the other thing here is to think about, as you sit there, is, is visibility of a subject or an area or a person better than actual truth or substance? Is getting something out there better than actually making sure it's actually accurate or worthwhile or useful? Now, anyone recognise the photo of the one in the middle? Name that, name that person? Gillian McKeith. Have you heard of her? Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of you would have done. Now, I'm probably going to upset a few people. This woman was uh, a source of much debate in the press. She was on Channel 4, did a nutrition program. Uh, it was all about, she was analysing people's poo, she was recommending ways for people to be healthier. In fact, if any of you have been on Facebook, you probably would have seen a, a thing that was being shared around that had a picture of her looking rough as oh, what's it. Uh, a photo of Nigella Lawson who eats fat, butter and God knows what else, looking absolutely stunning at 50. Anyway, the point is that Gillian McKeith is someone that's been perpetuated by the media as being an expert in her field. And she's a doctor, or so it seemed. But the actual reality was that her doctorate had been obtained by payment from a college in, in the United States that no one had ever heard of, that had no recognition, no um, credibility whatsoever. And when pushed on the subject, and she sort of waved it away, it was actually Ben, ben Goldacre actually who followed up on it, and one of his people that followed his forums chased it. And in the end, Channel 4 had to remove all mention of her having a doctorate off the website, because when actually push came to shove, they realised that what she'd actually done as a doctorate couldn't be obtained, and it never been seen, and it was from a college that wasn't accredited. So the question was, what value did it actually have? And many of the ideas that she perpetuated were often initially debated by other scholars and professors, and in the end, it turned out that some of the things that she was actually trying to put out there were frankly incorrect and wrong, and could have been debunked by a GCSE biology student. So you've got to be a little bit careful sometimes about what is being pulled onto the market. And media will always sensationalise and use what they want rather than actually necessarily looking for truth or substance. All right. Do we know what that is? Life Hadron awesome. Collider. Yeah, right, let's go for the next one. Do you know what that is? My family. <laughs> <laughs> Evolution, man. Evolution Man. Okay, next one. Super the Super Big Bang. Bang. Fourth one and final one. Global, Global warming. warming. What do all four of these things have in common? Imagery. No? Media They're all uncertain. Yes. All of these have conflicting publications. If you look in uh, on you know look at some like Google Scholar, all four of these items will have opposing views in journal papers. People will theorize and the ideas will clash. And why is that? We don't know. Or well, we do, but I'll come on to that in a minute. So why does science conflict? The example I always use with my undergraduate students is that of the Earth being flat and the Earth being round. Life went on for quite a few thousand years and people thought the Earth was flat and they were happy with it. You know, they thought you might fall off the edge if you sailed off the end, but because you couldn't see any different, they assumed it was flat and it made sense. Obviously over time we realised when people did actually sail around and came back in one piece, not being eaten by dragons, or finding that the planet was on the back of four turtles, that they did actually survive. The point there is, is that science often conflicts until a lack of new evidence comes on the top, and a good academic will basically use evidence and science that's gone before as building blocks to ultimately the ultimate truth. A bad academic will just argue their case to the blue in the face, but ideally you, you embrace all different ideas together and hopefully in the end you build something great and strong and have 100% clarity and truth of a problem. In the case of knowing whether the earth was round or not, it was really just a question of getting all the right pieces of the puzzle together and formulating the total picture as soon as you gather that evidence, a bit like the apple falling on the head of Newton. Here's a philosophical thing, another thing to think about when you're sort of necking your beer, is absence of evidence, evidence of absence. Something often happens when you see science in the media where people sort of say, well that, you know, that can't possibly happen. Uh, 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 sorry, I've got my tongue tied up. If absence of evidence, this is quite a mouthful this, evidence of absence, if something hasn't been seen, does that mean it doesn't actually exist? So for take Mars and Martians and people from outer space, life on other planets as an example, does the fact that there's no evidence there mean that it doesn't actually, they, they don't actually exist? 
and in some cases you'll think, well, we haven't got the proof for that. But the problem with media is, or when you see science perpetuated in the media, sometimes those things are completely missed and people take things at face value. Other thing to remember about that, you know, we don't often get when science is pushed out there is about placebos, which a lot of you will know a lot about, randomizations, the way that you actually, when you actually administer a protocol or an experiment to a group of people to make sure that you randomize things so that patterns don't filter through and contaminate results. Peer review and blind studies, which again is a lot of you will obviously know about already. Peer review is obviously very important. Oh, the other thing about Gillian McKeith, by the way, going back to the previous thing, was she's had no peer review publications whatsoever, nothing. So everything that she sort of says, on, it seems like I'm having an anti Julie McKeith thing now, but, but excuse me. But the point is, is that it's all very well to put an idea out there, but the whole benefit of peer review publication is that you've had your work assessed by a third party, and they analyze it and, and review it and determine whether it's suitable for publication. And it's not a flawless process. I've had some pretty ropey stuff put out, I think, looking back now that I've done, but there's some really, really good stuff out there, but it does help filter out a lot of the crap basically. And when you see something put out in the press, someone sort of says the world is going to end in seven days. Remember that guy, uh, what was his name, Camping? The American mathematician who's a statistician who said the world was going to end on December the, oh, I think it was May the 22nd or something last year. And when the day came and went, and everyone kind of said we're still here, as everyone's heading out to France to go to the top of the mountains and the rest of it, and he sort of recalculated it to be later in the year. It didn't happen again. Then we had the Mayan calendar that sort of thing as well. The point there is sometimes that sometimes people want to sensationalise the best possible or the most extreme outcome rather than where the lack of proof is. Camping stuff was never peer reviewed and I was McKeith's. So the lesson here is bear in mind the press generally want a story or a sound bite. They don't want the person that comes with it. So if I'm asked to say something on the rare occasions it happens, they're not interested in who I am as a person all they want me to do is to say something, ideally controversial, that's going to make people read something. And you have to be very, very aware of that. Here we go. Clip, I, I literally pulled it from, from the BBC News site about media sensationalising science. A report by the Social Market Foundation, an independent research group, has accused the UK media of sensationalising science. This is irresponsible reporting, can undermine public confidence in science and government. Right. Red wine, <laughs> chocolate, exercise, and the humble peanuts. What do all four of these things have in common? Cause my food. All four of these things have been either good for you or bad for you several times in the last hundred years, depending on who's, what flavour of the month is. Very few of these things have actually ever seen peer-reviewed publication actually had that actually investigated properly. However, all four of these things have in one way or another, uh, excise an example, there was a, uh, a Chinese scientist, and I can't honestly feel like we now remember his name, but his theory was that your heart had a limited number of beats in your lifetime, and if you ran out of beats, you died. So if you exercise where your heart rate increases, you are shortening your lifespan, which actually makes quite logical sense when you think about it. It's obviously not true, at least to the best of our knowledge as it currently stands. Chocolate, <laughs> one minute you're going to gain weight, then suddenly it's going to be good for blood pressure. How much do you have? How little? Is it white chocolate? Is it dark chocolate? What time of year should you have it? It all gets very confusing. Red wine, a little bit of moderation. And peanuts, suddenly they're fat and high in calories. Now hang on, they're good fats. Are they good fats or are they bad fats? What's the, what does a good fat or bad fat mean? So it all can get very, very confusing. And statistics in the media are the favourite one. Now this is probably a good example I use quite a lot of the time, whiskers. Eight out of ten owners said their cats preferred it. Now to give you a good example of how people don't often see it for what it really, really is, is that no one actually ever asked whose cats were asked. And what colour were these cats? When were these cats asked? Had they already eaten? Had they been starved for two weeks? You know, uh, you know, were the cats in America? Were they in the UK? Were they owned by women? Were, were they on the run from dogs at the time? The point is, if you don't know the conditions of the people you're actually asking, all you're getting is what we call selective bias, you know, whereby you are effectively cherry-picking the people that you're asking. If you look at a lot of statistics, that's why suddenly you'll get a political poll will suddenly swing two days before the big general election, because they've got to ask the, the denizens of Basildon what they think, who's going to get to the next government, but it doesn't take into account the personality of the entire market that's going to be voting. So selective bias is very important, but statistics can be incredibly misleading. 
So let's move on more about the media. I've painted quite a dark picture so far. It's like, oh, it's evil, it's bad, and all the rest of it. However, there are some good plus points to the media. And why the hell should we even bother in the first place? Well, getting work out there is better than doing research nobody has heard of that has no impact for nobody you actually know. Now, if you actually ever get the chance, there was a, a paper I pulled off once, and it was a scientist that had done a study of mushrooms in a Brazilian rainforest at a particular time of year. And he'd sampled a small, a particular, I don't know if species is the right word when it comes to mushrooms, but a particular type of mushroom. And it was a very narrow study of where he'd seen the effects of a certain type of rainfall at a certain type of year in this place in Brazil that no one had ever heard of. And it's good research, it followed a scientific method, it had concrete findings, it was very robust. The point is, what impact is that going to have on society as a whole? Do we all sit there when we go around the supermarket worrying about whether these mushrooms come from Brazil? If they have, what's going to happen? So, sometimes it's about making sure you put the right thing out there, but doing the right kind of work. When can we start being devil's advocate against you? <laughs> Anytime you like. Go on. Okay, that guy who did that mushroom experiment. Yeah. It's not me, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I tell you, that would have been so funny. If it, was. <laughs> it taught him how to analyse, correlate, investigate, yep. deliver yep. a paper yep. that went through analysis, yep. peer review, and integrity. Yep. Yep. He might be the guy that 10 years from now, because of that knowledge and that effort, uh, finds the cure for cancer. Absolutely. So, just because he chose a subject area, because when you do a paper, you've got to choose something nobody else has ever done. Absolutely. So, there aren't many of the good things left to yeah. do, so you've got to go and find something so obscure that no one can challenge you, or no one's done it, so that you can be unique and have a unique paper attached to your name. So, I, I see a lot of value in that to the academia, Maybe the results don't have value as we know today, other than those mushrooms may eventually be pretty important in herbalism or yeah. some other form. Do you believe in the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few? I don't believe in any needs. Okay. Yeah. That's fox me because I have no idea how to come back from that. <laughs> yeah. so, something we'll talk about tomorrow on a completely different topic is about ethics, really, and about how we look at things in different ways, depending on which ethical belief system that you have. And um, but something actually spinning off from that, actually, was a really, really good point made, was that should we be doing research, and this is a rhetorical question, should we be doing research that benefits as many people as possible, or should ideally we be pursuing something that, that deals with an individual minority? I'm actually completely around the house here, coming onto this actually a little bit later, I didn't intend to, but where, you know, is it for a lot of us that are involved in research here, or people that are actually interested in study, should you be studying something that's going to benefit lots of people, or ideally will save one life? And uh, think about that one, because we'll come back to that when I pick up something later on. That was a really good question. If you don't pass on knowledge, ultimately, I don't know if any of you remember this film. This is a film, this is The Time Machine, uh, one of my favourite films as a kid. Um, those who haven't read H.G. Wells, those who haven't read the book or seen the films, or the horrendous remake a few years back, what basically happened was, was that far into the future, due to the breakdown of society, mankind actually devolved into two separate species, the Eloi and the Morlocks. The Eloi, the good-looking Swedish-looking ones, okay, were on the surface of the planet enjoying the fruits of their labour, but they were ignorant. The Morlocks, who were slightly smarter, but couldn't actually go out into a light because it would blind them, they'd been underground for a very long time. And they would come up periodically, steal one of the Eloi, and they were cannibals. But the point here was, due to a lack of knowledge exchange, when you read the book it's really good, due to a lack of knowledge exchange, the breakdown of society, because that knowledge hadn't transferred, the whole of mankind suffered as a result, and it's important for us to make sure that knowledge is moving around, or at the very least, if bad knowledge is moving around, that we at least discuss, disseminate, and actually try and explode it. Problems are this, so the reasons why many academics, and I remember when I first went on the media course, what we look at now, three or four years ago it was now, um, they were asking volunteers, and very few academics wanted to do it. And the reason is, one, people, some people think it's unnecessary, which is fair enough, because they argue that journals are the vehicle for what we do as a profession. So why do we need to be in the media to do that? On the left-hand side, it's sort of like the, the, sort of the two sort of opposite ends. If you're good at what you do, and if you're pleased to share it and show it, it's your chance to banner wave a little bit, to show what you can do, and to make a difference in a very public domain. The downside is sometimes you can hang yourself by what you say. There, are, there, is, there is blowback. Sometimes you can be cornered, or you can be um, ridiculed or exposed. 
and it's so there's a, a very heavy negative burden on that and as a result a lot of people don't like doing it the other reason why media works not very popular with academics is, is that if you actually look at the way the profession that we're assessed we're, we're measured really in terms of our teaching ability our lecturing ability our ability to publish and our ability to get grants really they're the three there are others but they're the three main ones so arguably how does media really create any investment the other thing as well is, it's a bit like um, the thing I like to think about sometimes, a bit like the last scene from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Remember that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid are sat barricaded in this thing in Bolivia or something like that. They've got thousands of troops outside and they realise they're going to be running off to be probably shot down. It's the one final hurrah. And that is sometimes the problem when you float a good idea. There's a good chance that you're going to get cut down. And it's a risk. You know, sometimes it's safer not to say anything at all in a place safe. Well, this is the bit, the video's not working, is it? We haven't got the video. Don't worry about this because this isn't important. The, the point I was going to make, I was going to show a very short video, but the, the point here is, is that sometimes it's good not to go out there unless you're really sure about what you're going to say. Don't go out there and say something that's not worth actually showing. If you do remember later, go to YouTube, look at uh, an interview by Jerry Paxman and Chloe Smith. It's the, it's the 92nd interview that she has done. It's a really good example of someone who is from a science background getting completely foxed and cornered and hung out to dry. Well, I'll tell you about my little media experience now, which began in 2008, and as was mentioned in the introduction, it was all to do with initially with prosthesis, and I made a few mistakes, and I'll show you how. Originally, I started a project that was looking at whether prosthetic limbs would be appropriate in disability sport. And I did it initially because I met the right people at the right time. I was interested in sport. And I met someone that was interested in prosthesis. And at the same time, in 2008, Oscar Pistorius uh, hit his own form of controversy when he started using prosthesis and able-bodied sport and tried to qualify for the Olympics. And it's a well-trodden story, and I'll go into much more about that tomorrow night. But um, I, want to, I had this idea about, can I do something you know, and try and explore the controversy of that and see if I can prove whether he has an advantage or not. And I realised very, very quickly I couldn't prove it because I didn't have enough information and because Pistorius was ultimately just one man. Um, but I realised there was a lot of interest because it's a controversial topic and controversial topics do generate a lot of interest. There's a lot of unknowns. However, what happened was I learned a very important lesson. For the first six months to nine months of that, I was there doing papers for conferences, doing a lot of public engagement and it was going really, really well. And I lost sight of what I was supposed to be doing. What I, I thought I was doing was I was providing knowledge. What I lost touch with was that I was starting to basically focus so much on Pistorius, on focus so much on one man, that all I was really doing was saying whether one man had the right to participate or not. And I don't know where it happened, somewhere along the way, but this trip had something to do with it. I basically, on a complete round about the houses, our um, media manager at the university, uh, conned me, I should say, into going on a climbing weekend in Wales, up Snowdon. And the only reason I went was I was in a piss-up at the time, basically, at a, uh, in Hertfordshire, not too far away at the time. And it was going to be two days of climbing with a load of amputees that were ex-forces. They were all guys that weren't eligible under the Help for Heroes scheme, because some of the things, I, I don't know if you know this around, I only found this out at the same time, that Help for Heroes is extremely exclusive on who they support. Again, I'm going on a tangent, not a rant. Um, <laughs> Just to give you the reasons why, Help for Heroes don't support anyone that's been injured prior to 2001, basically. They only support those in the army. And anyone who was injured in anything prior to that, such as Iraq, the Gulf War, Falklands, are not covered. And if you leave the forces, you're not covered either. So it's actually incredibly exclusive. The problem is, is that Help for Heroes has a massive, massive revenue injection, these donations, and they do a fantastic job with who they do look after. But there's a lot of guys out who have been injured in conflict prior to that that aren't covered. And the charity that was doing this training weekend, uh, who were running, they were doing a, uh, a trip up Kilimanjaro. And what they'd done was, was that they had five ex, uh, mixture of army and RAF personnel who were going to do the trip up Kilimanjaro. The training weekend was to go up Snowdonia. They'd also got 15 punters, uh, able-bodied punters, to go with them uh, to make it worthwhile. What I learned on the trip was, one was really what the limitations of amputees were, which wasn't very much, they could do anything, especially ex-army personnel. In fact, we had the opposite problem, in they had a habit of actually doing too much, well beyond what their injury would allow them to do. Um, 
on day two we were basically welding and screwing prosthesis back together again that had just been destroyed on day one because the guys were running up and down mountains. Uh, but what I learned was, was that I'd started focusing so much on one man that I wasn't really doing a lot of good. And um, so what if I proved that Pistorius was illegal? What good was that really going to have? Yeah, it was going to make me popular for about all of five minutes, but it wasn't going to produce anything of a worthwhile mention other than it was going to victimise him. So I changed the orientation of the projects I was doing, actually widened the scope of rather worrying about what someone couldn't do, starting to think about what someone actually could do instead. Anyway, that went on for a while, and unbeknownst to me, my PhD thesis that I was working on at the time was really investigating not a way of how we could find out whether they were illegal, these procedures, <laughs> but actually find a way to try and make them actually fair in implementation so that everyone who used them could have an equal chance to win. So I've completely steered the project somewhere different. Anyway, at the same time, this was in 2012, uh, September last year, London Paralympic Games. In the uh, months running up to this, uh, Pistorius is the guy in green yellow, South African guy is obviously currently facing a murder charge in South Africa, having allegedly shot his girlfriend through the toilet door, having not checked that she was sleeping next to him at the time. Um, the other guy is Alan Oliveira, who's a Brazilian guy. Now, in the months leading into, up to it, uh, Pistorius had made some rants at Oliveira that he'd been getting unfair advantage from his prosthesis, which is amusing really because everyone had accused Pistorius of doing the same thing four years prior. Anyway, uh, Oliveira apparently had lengthened his prosthesis to make his limbs longer. And in the uh, 200 metres, which was Pistorius' second best event, Oliveira beat him. And you can see it on uh, YouTube and stuff like that. And you can see the look afterwards, meeting after the race, where Oliveira is trying to congratulate and console Pistorius, and Pistorius is having none of it. Um, it's never good to interview an athlete straight after a sports event, I know that personally, so you're going to be a bit grumpy. But it didn't go down very, very well because they felt that he'd, he'd abused the technology that he had. And the project I was working on, as a complete coincidence at the time, had basically come up with a system to explore that issue. So for a little while, I found myself getting caught up for about six, seven days with a lot of media traffic, a bit of radio stuff, a bit of TV stuff, which was quite scary, quite a lot of magazine work, that kind of stuff. And this is kind of went all a bit nuts, and there's a message I'm going to leave at the end of the talk later on about the benefit of doing this, but for a split set, I got asked, did you want to go on BBC News at five o'clock? And my initial instinct was to say no, because A, I didn't think I knew what I was talking about, and B, my mum was going to be watching, <laughs> uh, which is never a good thing. Um, but I thought, I thought, oh, balls to it, and why, not? why not, you know, what's the worst that can happen, you know, so I went up and did this thing, it was actually up in Southampton, now what you don't see is it always looks professional on TV, you have someone there, your, your sort of person's been interviewed or a reporter, and there's all this hustle and bustle in the background, it's always an office or something, what that actually was, was me sat in the corner of the secretarial pool, by a paper strimmer and a waste paper bin, right wedged in the corner, and then the only guy that was in that office was a guy with a mop, that was mopping around, and then I had this earpiece that was rammed into me about 10 seconds prior to going live, and all I heard was a little voice saying, are you ready? And I went, no. And I said, okay, live in five, four, then we count it down, bing. And I look at this little camera like that one, look at this little camera, and I'm thinking, what the hell am I gonna say? I have no idea what I'm gonna get asked. And your head just completely, it's like your favorite exam, your head just completely empties. You can't even remember your own name. Yeah, it's like, oh God. And he asked me a few questions, and I have no idea what I said. I know I didn't answer any of the questions he asked me. I went off talking about something completely different. Um, but it was actually a really good experience, because after that, I realised that A, um, sooner or later it's good to put yourself under a little bit of pressure sometimes. But also, I suddenly realised um, that what I'd been working in a classroom, and what I'd been working in an office with a pile of books for two or three years at this point, I was finally starting to get out there and to get people talking. And you could take something like that to any bar, you can take it to any funeral or family party or birthday and you can always get an opinion from someone and I suddenly realized the sort of research I wanted to do it was research that gets opinions from as many people as possible even if they don't agree with you because it makes it interesting um, something I actually got taught on the media course just uh, something you might watch when you go and watch the, the 10 o'clock news tonight and you hear someone an MP or someone being interviewed is is something that I was told to say uh, was uh, when you're asked a question stop pause say something like the following and that you might say that i am not going to agree with anything you've just said uh, but what i'm saying is this so you go off on a complete tangent if you actually watch the television you see how many people actually do this the media instructor i had actually told me person, to write this down on a piece of paper and do exactly that if i get any kind of a question that isn't bleedingly obvious 
certainly is, and that's a very good question you ask. However, and then move on to something completely different. Yeah, and watch how many people actually do it, it's really clever. Right, getting misquoted, this is the more negative side of my experience. Again, I haven't been prepared for this. It's in that sometimes, as I said earlier, the press will take what they want to take from something. If the research proves successful, this is, this is actually what I said, it was actually about a project that isn't mine, it's one of my colleagues. He's doing a prosthetic socket that goes over the stump of an amputee and it measures changes in pressure. It's a bloody clever idea, it was his PhD. Um, I was asked to write a press release because the other guy wasn't available and I thought it would be good exposure so I went for it, which was a stupid mistake because it wasn't my research. Uh, what I actually said in the press release I sent out was that if the research proved successful, the smart socket could benefit everyday people, athletes or even military personnel. By the time it got to the actual newspaper, what it actually said was, technological advances could see amputee soldiers returning to service, born with the university lecturers believe. I never said that. And the problem was, was, this was actually a very sensitive subject at the time, because we had Afghanistan and everything else going on, and guys were getting killed. So when you see someone there with a prosthetic socket, and saying, can this guy go back to combat? I was then fielding phone calls for weeks saying, can my son go back to combat with your device? The thing's still on the drawing board. We haven't even built the prototype properly yet. So the negative downside is you look like a fool because it looks like you're trying to promote something that doesn't exist. I was a fool because I was trying to promote something that wasn't actually mine. And I was a fool for believing the media were going to take me word for word, okay, which was my mistake. When I was talking earlier about the needs of the many outweighing the needs of the few, um, this was kind of the random thing that I actually got into. Now this happened by complete accident. I was at a conference in Scotland a couple of years ago, and I was at a dinner that night. I'd done a, I'd done a talk on, I can't remember what I was doing it on, I think I was doing it on prosthesis again or something. But I, I bumped into a prosthetist in, who was based in Manchester. And he had an Irish cyclist, he was an ex rugby player, he'd lost his leg in a rugby accident. I don't know exactly how it happened, it was a very unusual, very rare, bizarre accident, but it basically meant that he'd have to have his leg amputated just below the knee. And he was a big guy, I mean, he was six foot four and built like a brick outhouse. And the guy said, Look, he wants to be a Paralympian, he wants to run, you know, he wants to ride his bike at the, the London Paralympics. Um, and this is the prosthesis that we're using. And they did a whole presentation with 20 minutes on this prosthetic limb they were using. It looked terrible. It was awful design. Um, it was really using the limits of the NHS components they could access. Anyway, after the talk had finished, I was at the bar with this guy. I sort of said, look, I, you know, I, know I could redesign what you're trying to do here so easily to make it a lot more comfortable for him to use and a more, a bit, give him better performance than what he's using. And I didn't think anything else of it. And then two months later, just before Christmas that year, I got a phone call saying, are you still able to come out and redesign this thing? And I kind of went, uh, you're all right then, okay. So I told off to Manchester, he said, by the way, we need this thing next month. We need it in four weeks. I kind of went, mm, okay. Um, and what we did was we actually designed, it's made of carbon fibre, and it's actually designed, it's, it, you can't really see the shape of it, but it looks like a teardrop, sort of a teardrop shape. There's a, there's a reason why it's not quite a teardrop. And it connects basically his stump, which ends about there, with the actual pedal of the bike about there. And all that's got to do is go through the air as quickly as possible with minimised air resistance, and also there's transfer as much power from that leg and his backside basically down through it to get to the pedal. So it hasn't going to look like a leg, and that was the first mistake they made. With a lot of prosthetists or a lot of people who have suffered amputations, they want something that's going to resemble what they've lost. Um, but in this case, this is all about performance, this is about medals, this isn't about anything other than that. So the first thing I tried to convince them, it took some convincing, was to try and allow me to create something that didn't look human. And that was psychologically very difficult for the athlete to take. Um, it was very easy for the prosthetist to do, because it meant you didn't have to cut and match the skin. And, uh, you can get things like matching hair follicles now. If you get the, the latest things, um, Heather Mills' uh, prosthesis she had done will colour match to her skin. But not only that, they have to show blemishes because you can't just have it skin colour because it won't look natural. So they actually put like little blotches on it to make it look like it's got birthmarks and imperfections. They have hair follicles to try and make it match. But none of that applied to this kind of project. And this project was completely separate from my PhD, completely separate to my research. How am I doing for time? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right, we're nearly. Um, it was completely different, and I realised that actually sometimes doing work for one person was better than doing work that was going to affect thousands, and I've been wrong to a certain extent. 
but also in that, again, this did get quite a lot of media traffic, and they were interested in, well, again, does it have a performance enhancement? I suddenly found myself on the opposing argument that I'd actually been putting out there a year prior, where I'd spent 12 months saying, it's wrong, it's wrong, we shouldn't be actually putting this kind of stuff out there, it gives people unfair advantage. I'd actually created an unfair advantage for someone that was at the Olympics, or Paralympics, sorry. So, actually, I came across as a bit of a hypocrite for about all of five or ten minutes, but I got an enormous sense of satisfaction out of it, because... The athlete who was continually slimming down and transforming himself from a big rugby player into effectively a jockey of a bicycle, a cyclist, uh, actually gave him a chance to win, as it was actually. He won the World Championships earlier in the year. He didn't have a great games at London um, for other reasons, but he had a really, really successful year. So the lesson I got out of that was doing something positive is better than promoting something negative sometimes. It took me three or four years to work that one out as well. Right, so this was the big lesson that I learned from all of this. So from dealing with you know, the press, doing stuff for a lot of people, doing stuff for a few people. The big lesson that I actually learned was saying yes may not lead to success, but it's more likely than saying no. So when I use the word success, and I'm putting that in I don't mean necessarily fame or fortune or publications. What I mean is something that actually makes you get up in the morning. Effectively. So when you get up on that Monday morning, if you're one of those lucky people that do a job you actually love doing, and fortunately I do, but when you wake up on that Monday morning, you need a reason to get out of bed, saying yes, I found, I'll show you what actually I mean by that. Now you're not going to read this diagram, but you're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. These were the many different things that happened over the four years, and how they, they all intersect with each other. So I started the research project. I then tested the water at a UK conference, which is a pretty standard way that you float ideas in academics. Sometimes before you put it into a journal, you want to get, you know, see how hot the water is. Put it out of the conference, get some feedback. Off the back of that, I then published in books and journals, and I got invited to talk at other conferences and did the media training course. So there you can see it splurge out. Off the back of the talk I did in Germany, I then got invited to Spain and Glasgow, and then I worked with the International Paralympic Committee on one of their committees actually analysing their legislation. Again, so that's two things coming out of one. As it goes on a bit further, you have the Snowden trip, that then goes to TV and radio and press stuff, and that then ultimately ends up fanning out to another talk in Sweden and uh, you know, proceeds for the cycling athlete, public engagement, and then the British Science Festival keynote speech thing. But the whole point is all it started was there and it's fanned out. And the only common link between all of it was I tried to just shrug my shoulders and went, oh, hell, why not? Just say yes. Because if you say no, you're not going to get anywhere. So it's not turning to kind of like an American style, yes, management <laughs> training course now. But the point here is, is that you know, no one's going to bang, it sounds a bit cheesy, but no one's going to knock on your door and suddenly offer you an Oscar or something. But if you just say yes, there's a book called Yes Man. In fact, Jim Carrey was in a film that was based loosely on the book. I really highly recommend reading it because it was all about a guy that for the period of one month would just say yes to anything, whatever it was. And he ended up all over the planet and you know, with celebrities and all the rest of it, just because he said yes. And my experience of research and my career, which initially was as a university teacher, has completely changed purely because of the fact that for the period of three or four years, I just kind of went, oh, what the hell, why not? Where's it going to go? You know, my career may end in flames, but I was never the greatest expert in this anyway, so I saw it as I had nothing to lose. And that should be basically that. And that should be about right. Ish. Thanks very much. So as I said, take the opportunity.